might um, we might kick off. It's just ticked over four thirty, and um, you guys have taken time out of your work day um, to finish up here this afternoon. So welcome everybody. Um, welcome to the hot topic in palliative care from the Centre for Palliative Care. I'm Mark Bowie, who um, I'm sort of co-acting acting director while Peter Hudson's away on a Fulbright scholarship in New York. Um, so welcome from his behalf and our behalf as well today. Um, I'd certainly like to take this time to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we're meeting on today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and to really pay our respects on your behalf and mine to the elders past and present, and for anyone that's in the audience today that obviously has connections to this land as a traditional elder or to other parts of Australia. Um, it's great to see so many of you here. This is an important and exciting topic from our point of view. We're taking a bit of time at the moment in St Vincent's and with um, our VCCC chair in the Centre for Palliative Care to be looking at some of the vulnerable populations um, that we are working with and obviously people who are in the prison system under correctional health of those vulnerable populations. The importance today is that we will be filming the presentation and so that um, if you're asking questions, which Charles is quite happy to um, take questions during the course of the meeting as well as at the conclusion, um, we'll, either Charles or myself will repeat the question on behalf of the recording today. Um, you've seen the reminder notices coming up on the screen, hopefully they're still flicking through about a couple other save the dates for the research colloquium and other things, but today we're really here to focus on Charles and his presentation, um, looking at the challenges of working in the correctional system, but particularly chronic disease management, touching on palliative care in correctional health. Now Charles and I go back a long way. Um, in fact, we were interns together uh, a number of years ago. Most Robbie's hitting in 1986, um, and so our connections have weaved in and out of our lives, but particularly importantly now, obviously, that we're both here at St Vincent's. Um, Charles finished his medical degree at Monash in 1985 and has really worked in the general practice environment for a number of years, focusing on sports medicine, but really he's taken a walk through a number of areas, including psychiatry, emergency medicine, rural or remote medicine. So really quite well placed, I suspect, to be taking this challenging role in his career over the last two years now, Charles, two and a half years now, as Medical Director for Correctional Health, which brings the link in between, uh, and also working with the youth justice system as well. So a very important role, an important role that is often underscored in the system of how we look after the health of the people that are uh, living and obviously part of the correctional health system. So it's great we've got him here today to speak with us. He'll be talking for the next 35, 40 minutes or so. And as I said, he's happy to take questions along the way. Um, but we will have an opportunity for questions afterwards. And we'll definitely have an opportunity to sort of mix and do a bit of networking with you guys and to hear back from you afterwards uh, outside. So welcome, Charles. And uh, thank you for being here today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark, and thank you for inviting me um, to speak about the challenges of chronic disease management in the prison population. Can you hear me OK? Yeah. Um, so uh, what I thought I'd perhaps do is work out how this IT system works first, but then once I've got past that, uh, get on to the presentation. And as Mark said, if you have any questions for me during the course of this presentation and afterwards, I'm more than happy to answer your questions. Uh, as Mark said, I'm the Medical Director of St Vincent's Correctional Health, which covers both uh, Portfield Prison and uh, Juvenile Justice, uh, which is uh, uh, at the moment at Malmesbury, Parkville and Gravillia Unit at Darwin Prison. I'm mainly going to talk about the adult uh, prison population tonight. 
What I thought I'd do is just give you a bit of an order of events for the presentation. So we're going to talk about St Vincent Correctional Health Service. Uh, then we're going to uh, touch on some prisoner demographics in Australia and Victoria. Followed by that, we're going to talk about the chronic diseases that we find and really in relation to what we manage uh, at Port Phillip Prison. And then uh, go on to discuss uh, some specific disease management and prevention programs. Uh, then we'll, uh, I'll touch on some challenges that we have in the adult prison population and uh, the challenges of managing the chronic diseases. And then I've got three case studies which uh, I think are quite interesting and do highlight some of the complexities and difficulties in managing uh, prisoners. And followed by that, at the end, I'll have a bit of a dabble in discussion of palliative care and also discuss some of the deaths that we've had over the last couple of years for patients who have been accommodated at Port Phillip Prison. Um, so before I go on, it might be a good time also to remind everyone that I've actually uh, uh, had to uh, get permission by G4S Security Services, who are the prison management at uh, Port Phillip Prison, and also Justice Health, who provide the clinical governance for uh, all the health services across Victorian prisons, uh, to get their permission to show these, uh, uh, this presentation, also the data, and some of which comes from Justice Health, yeah, electronic medical record, which is called JCare. Care. Right. So any discussion about St Vincent's Correctional Health uh, would be remiss if we didn't talk about the Sisters of Charity, who came out in, uh, in 1821 from Ireland to set up uh, care, health care for the condemned, the convicts in New South Wales. <coughs> Following that, they set up a health care service at Long Bay Prison, and over the last 30 years, St Vincent's Hospital here in Melbourne has been providing tertiary healthcare services to the prison population. And that includes uh, when Pentridge was opened until it closed in 1997, where some of those inmates were moved over to Portfolio Prison. It's also worth noting that the contract that St Vincent's Correctional Health has to provide health services to um, prisoners has actually recently been renegotiated and so we now have another 10 years starting in September 17 with an optional 10 years on top of that. So that all takes up to 50 years by the time we get through that next 20 year contract and beyond. So St Vincent's Correctional Health, what are we about? Well we're about the St Vincent's mission and the mission is all about contributing to the patient's health and well-being while they're in custody to reduce the burden of disease for, the, the, for our patients, their families, and the wider community. This, that's the uh, front entrance of Port Phillip Prison, which is out in Truganina, Loverton North. Uh, <clears throat> if you want an aerial view of Port Phillip Prison, you just have to watch the Channel 7 News at 6 o'clock. <laughs> um, it's on there just about every week, and you can be sure that uh, uh, the news chopper has got there before the microambulance does and uh, often we're seeing patients with holding a, a bandage to their neck where they've just been stabbed. So, <coughs> so that's uh, the Channel 7 news for you. Um, also to remind you that Port Phillip Prison is actually a maximum security prison and uh, as I said before it's managed by G4S. So what do we do at Port Phillip Prison? What does St Vincent's Correctional Health actually do there? Um, a hell of a lot. We're an extremely busy unit. At any given day, we're looking up after over a thousand patients. We, um, we provide acute medical care and we, and to all patients and we're the first responders to all prisoners, uh, GFRS staff, uh, uh, St Vincent staff and contractors. We're akin to a small town and uh, we're about 20 minutes from Sunshine Hospital when things are really acute and about 30 minutes from the city hospitals. We've got more than 700 prisoners at any, any given time who are on regular medications. Um, as I said we provide acute and chronic health care plus we have a full range of services in allied health, radiology, pathology, OT, optometry, podiatry, dentistry, 
Uh, so we're a very busy unit and a lot of that happens in St Thomas outpatients. So where we have uh, uh, several GPs, a full complement of nursing staff, psychiatric nurses, uh, psychiatrists, so we're an extremely busy unit. We see over 10,000 GP consultations a year. Uh, there are 50,000 uh, registered nurse consultations, assessments, reviews, um, attendances in the unit for code blacks, which are the medical emergencies. And uh, we have about 30,000 uh, psych nurse reviews and, and assessments as well, which includes crisis calls and uh, uh, risk reviews. So Port Phillip Prison is a central movement hub for all the prisons in Victoria. So any movement, whether it's a reclassification or it's for an appointment, comes, generally comes through Port Phillip Prison, and which means that we're getting anywhere from 30 to 40 receptive prisoners every day going in and out. And for each of those prisoners, we have to do a, a, an admission or a reception and ultimately a discharge. We also have to make sure all, they've got all their medical needs covered in terms of their appointments and we also um, make sure that they've all got their medication, medications organised. So uh, we've probably got greater than the entire population of prisoners in Victoria going through Port Phillip Prison in less than a year. So it's a really busy uh, prison. <clears throat> St Vincent's also, we have admin there that, and they are responsible for uh, doing the bookings for these uh, specialist outpatient appointments here at St Vincent's. And um, they uh, are also extremely busy and they liaise closely with the, the outpatient uh, clinics here. Um, in terms of the hospitals, we've got St John's Hospital, which is a 20 bed uh, uh, facility, which is a secondary care facility. It basically provides <coughs> a services similar to a cottage hospital would in a country town um, with medical observation cells, uh, short stay and step down admissions from here from St Vincent's. Uh, we also can admit patients who have greater nursing needs who may not be able to cope in the uh, accommodation units. Uh, we provide all levels of aged care nursing, 24-hour uh, nursing as well, and palliative care where appropriate. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, St John's has actually got a high occupancy rate of usually over 90% and it's generally in great demand across the state, including the other prisons where they often want us to take a, a patient uh, who they may not be able to cope with or manage um, appropriately in one of the country prisons. Um, as well as some of the remand prisons too. Finally, St Augustine's, as you probably know, is a 10-bed secure ward here at uh, uh, St Vincent's, and uh, it's, uh, it caters for men and women, and works, we work, work closely between Port Phillip and St Augustine's to uh, manage patients and, and uh, movements and step down. Let's talk about prisoner population. Um, <clears throat> at the end of 2015, there were over 37,000 full-time prisoners in Australia. Back in 2011, there were actually 4,500 prisoners in Victoria. The current figure is at 6,500, so that's about a 45% increase in over six years. It's roughly about 7% increase uh, growth in prisoner population every year. Um, those 6,500 are actually distributed across 13 state prisons and two privately run prisons. Um, Port Phillip Prison is currently the largest prison with 1,072 bed capacity. Uh, generally it's just about bulging at, at that figure. <coughs> um, coming, up, coming online later this year is Ravenhall Prison which will be the third private prison and that will be initially uh, set up for 1,000 beds and with the capacity to get an extra 300 beds online and at the current rate of growth of 7% per year uh, it won't take long before those 1300 beds are actually required. Uh, within Ravenhall also there's 75%, uh, 75 psychiatric beds as well. Are there any questions so far? Um, looking at some of the demographics with sex and age, uh, the Australian experience uh, when you look at the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare, 
uh, it talks about 92% of prisoners across Australia are male. Uh, and uh, in Victoria, that figure is probably a little bit closer to 6% uh, of females and 94% male. When we look at age distrib distribution, you can see there that 40% um, of males are over 35 years of age and only 12% are actually over 45. And that over 45 year old uh, age group would be where you would expect to have the biggest chronic disease burden uh, on and demands on resources. So when I, what do I mean by chronic disease burden in the Christmas population? Well, uh, this list reflects not only the most common areas of disease, but also the chronic diseases um, that demand the greatest economics and resource, resources to manage them. There are approximately 54% uh, of prisons at Portfield Prison that are, they're on a chronic health care plan. Um, the, again, the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare talks about 32% about of Australian prisoners have got a chronic disease. And that appears to be consistent with our experience at Port Phillip Prison as well. It also means that if 54% have got chronic health care plans and 32% have got chronic disease, the other 22% who have a chronic health care plan uh, fall into what I would call a non-medical category, which looks at mainly risk prevention, uh, uh, risk disease and prevention, uh, disease risk and prevention, thank you. And uh, I'll show you that in a moment. So if we look at mental health, uh, that's by far the biggest burden um, on e economics and resources and the largest diagnostic category. Substance use disorder, uh, very similar to what's in the community when we look at the prison population, but they've got a limited uh, access to, uh, to drugs. So as we know in the community, we've got ice, cocaine, heroin, ecstasy, synthetic drugs, alcohol, tobacco, cannabis, prescription items, and over-the-counter items. In prison, they're limited pretty much to what they can get their hands on, which generally is ice, heroin, and often diverted drugs, which might include suboxone, which they often inject, uh, quetiapine and pregabalin, which are sort of units of currency in prison and the source of uh, the occasional assault as well. Um, asthma has probably got a uh, prevalence in prison similar to the community. And uh, then we have all the usual diseases like heart disease, um, heart failure, atrial fibrillation, uh, acute coronary syndrome, uh, liver disease, generally by far the, the largest component of liver disease we see, see in the prison population is hepatitis C infection and uh, we've got other, other diseases affecting liver like hepatitis B. Uh, we've also got alcoholic liver disease and we see the full gamut of cirrhosis, uh, hepatomas, liver failure and uh, including uh, end stage with encephalopathy. Epilepsy is a little bit of a tricky one. Uh, true, ep true epilepsy is probably not that common and uh, <clears throat> can be difficult to distinguish between true epileptiform activity and pseudo seizures. But the most common form of uh, seizure activity you see in the prison population is uh, related to drug withdrawal. Uh, diabetes, uh, we mostly see, as in the, in the community, we see type 2 diabetics. Uh, there are a few type ones, and uh, with the, the thing that happens in prison, especially with the sentence uh, prisoners, they tend to, um, over time, they tend to put on weight because they've never eaten so well in their lives. Uh, they often lack exercise, and uh, they often make poor dietary choices. So they're risk factors for heart disease, uh, increased cholesterol, diabetes, they all increase uh, in prison. Chronic pain is a really significant factor and, uh, and a problem that we manage every day uh, in the prison population. They have got any number of reasons why they have chronic pain and uh, a bit of an occupational hazard for some of them, unfortunately. But um, there's a significant prevalence of uh, chronic injuries. Uh, they, have, they have neuropathic pain, um, hence the request for pregabalin and, and gabapentin. Um, lower back pain with disability, pain from previous trauma such as motor, motor vehicle accidents, motorbike accidents, falls from great heights, 
uh, assaults, stabbings and uh, gunshot wounds. It's not uncommon to find some incidental radio-opaque foreign bodies on a chest x-ray or a leg x-ray uh, from their previous activities. Um, one disease I haven't listed there is dental. Uh, just about, uh, I'd say probably the majority of prisoners have got poor oral hygiene and they've got poor dental care and that relates to uh, poor diet on the outside, uh, neglect of their dental hygiene and uh, chronic drug misuse. Oh, here we go, okay. All right. Um, so what are the risk factors for chronic disease in prisoners? Well, they're probably very similar to what you see in the community, particularly in vulnerable populations, uh, marginalised people. We're looking at uh, education levels where uh, they are lower in, than in the general population, with only 16% of prisoners completing year 12, and less than half of, of that number for Indigenous prisoners. Socioeconomic factors include dysfunctional family backgrounds and unemployment. Uh, a history of homelessness is commonly seen uh, uh, in prison and it's associated with increased uh, rates of mortality, anywhere between two and five times the general population. They also have increased risks of infectious disease <coughs> and increased rates of infectious disease. Um, correctional patients with a history of mental illness often present with high-risk behaviours, uh, including illicit drug use, polysubstance abuse, intravenous drug use, uh, sharing of, it, of injecting uh, equipment and unsafe sex practices. And I read that when uh, assessed in prison, almost half of patients are diagnosed with a mental health condition, including alcohol and other drug misuse, and this appears to be consistent with what we see at Port Phillip as well. All right, so what are the chronic diseases? And generally we go by the chronic health care plans that we perform on, uh, on all patients where indicated. The, by far the, the biggest number of uh, chronic health care plans and therefore disease burden that we see in prison it relates to mental illness. Between mental illness and asthma, uh, we're looking at 75% of chronic health conditions. The, uh, <clears throat> the other very common disease is hepatitis C, but liver disease only reflects the, the complicated hepatitis C uh, patients or uh, other uh, liver diseases such as cirrhosis and uh, uh, um, liver failure. So, um, so that that's a, gives you a really good indication of what we're dealing with every day, pretty much a lot of mental illness and uh, asthma. And you can see that cancer takes a very small number, um, but uh, obviously very significant when dealing with each of those patients. Um, if we look at the three, the top three chronic d disease burdens, uh, the as I said, the first one would be mental illnesses, and um, you know these chronic diseases, these chronic mental illnesses, they demand enormous burden, and and uh, they often require fairly uh, a considerable amount of psychiatric counselling, psychi psychiatrist reviews, crisis calls, assessments, and managements of self of uh, suicide and self harm. Um, they require appropriate discussion with the prison management and placement of at-risk patients and they often inc involve case conferencing between the health service and the uh, and G4S or <coughs> prison management. There's a considerable amount of time and effort that goes into appropriate medication management. If you can imagine prisoners who are used to taking what they like on the outside and they have an expectation when they get into prison that that will continue. Uh, so managing those inappropriate patient demands uh, for sedatives and opiates can be quite draining, but uh, an important component of their rehabilitation. Um, Asthma, anywhere between 21 and 30 per cent of patients in prison have asthma and have a history of asthma. They're all commenced on an asthma chronic health care plan, 
uh, which uh, is reviewed annually or sooner if required. Uh, every patient with asthma is, uh, is referred for spirometry, which we do on site at Portfilla Prison. Um, they're all offered the annual flu shot, and the 65-year-old and over uh, offered the Pneumovax immunisation. All patients with asthma who are prescribed inhalers get to keep those inhalers with them at all times, including in the cells, uh, and we uh, make sure they have access to spacer devices and nebulizers uh, if and when required. <clears throat> There's always a security issue about which... Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, just a question about mental health going back 54%. Yep. Um, to what extent do you think the mental health status is leading to criminality and incarceration? Or is there a component of that 54% mental illness subsequent to being incarcerated and a part of the context of being in prison? Okay, thank you. Uh, the question was, uh, if I get it right, uh, is the mental health there first, or does the mental health uh, condition come about as a, as a result of the incarceration? I would say, by and large, the mental health condition is already there and has contributed to their incarceration, the reason for their, their incarceration. Uh, we certainly do have uh, patients who are distressed by being incarcerated. There's no, no question that you see a lot of distress, uh, separation from family, um, and any number of reasons. Uh, we often see that reflected in voluntary starvations and uh, behaving, I suppose, inappropriately, but also uh, with non-compliance, aggression, any number of things that can <coughs> be uh, can also can also limit your capacity as a health provider to engage with those patients. <coughs> but overall, uh, we have quite a large. Uh, mental health team that uh, assesses patients. We do crisis calls, risk, risk reviews. Um, <clears throat> anyone who's deemed at risk, they, we, um, we have a, a category a rating of uh, psychiatric illness, anywhere from P, what's called P1 to P4, where P1 is acutely psychotic. Uh, we also have uh, suicide ratings where S1 would be a high suicide risk, S3, S4 would be lower risk. So there's a, there's a very well established protocol and way, uh, method uh, for managing patients who are distressed, uh, whether they've had a pre-incarceration pre mental illness or not. And so uh, we often do see patients coming in who are really very unsettled and can be acutely psychotic. Uh, they, they need to be put in a... Uh, a, what's called a mule head cell when they first come into custody, and that's often not at Port Phillip, that's often at, at a remand prison. And, uh, and that, that inevitably is related to some, uh, some drug abuse, nearly always, and often is a part of a, a, um, a psychosis related to um, a drug, drug use. Okay. Yeah. There's a fair amount of asthma in that population. Uh, yeah. I think double what we expect. A fair amount of asthma in the population is right double what we might expect. Yeah. <coughs> um, is, um, is this asthma you're talking about here or COPD? Is that pure uh, asthma? No, it's asthma. And the, the I suppose the, the the bar is set fairly low for asthma, so anyone who says they've got a history of asthma may have used the puffer within the last 12 months. We would uh, categorise them as asthmatic. If we've got some doubt that they're asthmatic, we can simply do a spirometry and uh, with a uh, pre and post ventilin as well. But I imagine you would have a lot of COPD as well. Well, interestingly, uh, probably not as much as you would see in the general population. Uh, we've, as you probably know, we, we banned tobacco smoking in the prison population probably about a year ago. Um, there is still, uh, they still smoke, but it's called tobacco, where they dry up some tea leaves, wrap it up in the paper and, and set that alight. <clears throat> but uh, certainly we do see COPD. Uh, the severity of the COPD is much less um, prominent to what I remember when Mark and I were interns and young residents 
uh, probably just don't see that level of severity like we used to, including in the prison population. Okay. Um, all right, so we'll just move on, move on to the next slide. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so the hepatitis C, chronic hepatitis C infection is the third largest burden on medical resources. In Victorian prisons, the seroprevalence of hep C virus is over 30%. If you look at the, um, <clears throat> if you look at the anti hep C antibodies, uh, you'll find those in, in anywhere between 35 and 50% of full time prison prisoners. Females are twice as likely as, as male to be hep C positive. Mode of transmission is generally through intravenous drug use with the sharing of needles and equipment and to a lesser extent tattooing, uh, homemade tattoo equipment, which still happens and uh, we, still, we still, still see homemade tattoos that get infected and have to treat those. Um, the, uh, we provide bloodborne virus and sexually transmitted infection testing for all new receptions. They have the option to decline those, but we certainly encourage them. And uh, with regard to um, harm minimisation, one of the big things that's come out over the last 12 months has been the state funding for the statewide hepatitis program in throughout Victorian prisons. Uh, and over the last 12 months, there's been a... Uh, <clears throat> I'm just having a look here. There's... There has been, uh, so just going back a step, so the hepatitis C virus, the reason for the hepatitis program, um, there was a 9.4% uh, hepatitis C virus incidence amongst people who inject drugs being uh, one of the harm st reduction strategies. Uh, we also include uh, other things like access to, to bleach to clean uh, injecting equipment and also access to the OSTP program which is the opioid substitution program. 49% um, report injecting drug use in follow-up post hep C treatment so even though you might get, treat them with for hepatitis C they continue to use drugs and inject. Um, they also continue to share apparatus with 31% even though they've been treated would still be sharing their apparatus. Um, the reason for the importance of the hep statewide Hep C program is that between 5,000 and 10,000 inmates are released from prison into the community every year. Um, there was a significant injection of money, as I said, to eradicate Hep C from the community, and uh, the target is 80% reduction of Hep C prevalence by 2020. This is my simple version uh, and my, uh, my attempt to simplistically show the relationship between uh, the most chronic, common chronic diseases which uh, offer a large economic burden. The common link between the mental illness and infectious diseases like Hep C and increasingly HIV through intravenous drug use is this area in the middle where there's high risk behaviour exhibited by patients. Um, intravenous drug use, especially with sharing of needles, unprotected sex, inappropriate uh, and illicit drug use, um, they all contribute to the increased rates of infectious disease. The other contributing factors towards the high risk behaviours are, as we've said before, homelessness, poor education, unemployment and dysfunctional family background. But there is a definite link, and you're seeing it every day when you're managing patients who have got, uh, whether, whether they've got a personality disorder or whether they've got a, uh, a uh, intellectual disability or ABI, the high-risk behaviours do end up increasing their risk of developing a bloodborne virus or contracting an STI. And uh, I've mentioned TB and syphilis there. We do see small numbers of those. and. Uh, um, when, and TB, particularly active TB, is a particular problem, if you can imagine, in the prison. So we have our own uh, ways of dealing with that. 
Um, this is a snapshot of patient numbers with infectious diseases during March this year at Port Phillip Prison. And just by comparison, you can see the numbers of hep C are far greater than any other category uh, of infectious disease. All right, so how do we prevent infectious diseases in prison? Well, if we look at bloodborne viruses, we provide education and counselling, and there is an immunisation bloodborne virus uh, uh, at nurse. She's uh, trained and she's uh, credentialed to provide immunisations, including for hep B immunisation and counselling. Uh, bleach is available in the uh, accommodation units for those who are using. Uh, 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 equipment to inject, particularly shared equipment. The, uh, the other important preventive measure, harm minimisation measure, is the opioid substitution treatment program, which I'll talk about shortly. For sexually transmitted infections, again, there's education and counselling, and uh, commonly we see chlamydia, the occasional gonorrhea, and every now and then so early latent syphilis, um, and there, is, uh, there are condoms available in the medical centre. The opioid substitution treatment program. Well, it's basically uh, methadone or suboxone at the moment. And at the moment uh, at Port Phillip, we've got about 175 people on opioid substitution treatment. 15 of those would be on suboxone, which is buprenorphine naloxone, and they're films, sublingual films. It's a very important harm minimization strategy. Um, the methadone is the preferred drug and Justice Health had put out re re revised guidelines last year, in fact 2015, there where methadone is the preferred drug and that's mainly because suboxone is more easily diverted and tends to be, as I said, melted or dissolved and injected. Um, the, um, all patients who go into an OSTP program have to sign a contract uh, uh, and it's essentially it's a behavioural contract so that they comply with the terms of the OSTP program and often that's related to no abusing of staff, uh, no diversion of medication um, and, and other behavioural uh, uh, points in the uh, contract. Reason for the opioid substitution therapy treatment program is to reduce bloodborne virus transmission. Uh, it's uh, by way of reducing drug injecting, also harm minimisation by having someone on the program uh, uh, lends towards um, the reduction in opiate overdose, both in prison and also post-release. Um, we also have a community OSTP referral when a patient is discharged so to ensure that there's continuity of care uh, <clears throat> because we know within the first month of release uh, from prison there's an increased risk of mortality for uh, uh, patients. And we also know that if they've um, reduced their opioid um, tolerance for some reason in prison and they get out and they want to start injecting or taking oral opioids they've got a far greater chance of accidental overdose. So it's important that we continue that, uh, that care and opioid substitution pre-release and post-release. <clears throat> Just getting back to this uh, statewide hep C treatment, uh, uh, where some recent figures from the statewide uh, hepatitis program uh, staff has uh, they've, they've done a presentation showing that out of 174 patients who were treated with directly acting antivirals, 166 achieved sustained virological response after 12 weeks, which is uh, considered a cure. So it's been a very successful program up to today. I think there are about 195 people who have been cured of hepatitis C. When they did their follow-up, uh, they also found that two had been reinfected with hepatitis C and that's because of uh, continued inter intravenous drug use. <coughs> yeah, any questions there? Yeah. Tim, okay, thank you. Thanks, Mark. Um, 
I should be able to get through then. Um, so when I talk, spoke before about the 22% of non-medical chronic health care plans, that basically related to things like addressing Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, who are the, probably the greatest uh, number of patients who require a chronic health care plan and essentially a, a pre preventive care plan because of their increased risk of developing diabetes, renal disease, uh, heart disease. Uh, we also look at the over 60 years of age and uh, some other uh, other groups, including patients who might be on seven or more medications. So that, that graph is just to give you an indication of um, some of the other activities that we do at Port Phillip Prison, particularly addressing some patient groups. All right, so what are the challenges at uh, Port Phillip Prison or any other prison for that matter, managing patients, particularly with chronic disease? Well, um, and do we see a difference in the attitudes, uh, compliance and outcomes between the younger patients compared to the ones who are 45 or over? Um, <clears throat> probably, probably break down the challenges in treating patients into three separate areas. One would be security, next one would be accommodation factors, and the third one would be uh, patient factors. Security issues really relate to, I'll speed it up a bit, okay. That we're probably looking at uh, uh, issues related to access they often get locked down, you can't access them easily, they can't access you easily, it might have been because of their behaviour or simply there's activity going on, security activity going on in prison and none of us have got control and essentially security comes first. Um, they might have been moved to another prison, they might have been transferred somewhere else. So often that, those are limiting factors in trying to manage a patient in a timely manner. <clears throat> that's an old, uh, that's an old photo of Port Phillip Prisons, and uh, courtesy of Google. But um, uh, you can see that it's uh, in the centre. There is basically the medical centre, and there can be quite a long walk to the outer units, of which there are more now. And uh, so, so accommodation factors, uh, and again, they might be in a management cell where they're locked down 23 hours a day, and uh, management units as well, all to do with their behaviour or, or various other security issues. So um, it can, can interfere with your timeliness and your, of your management. All right, so the other challenges, well, patient factors and, you know, they're basically they can be a fickle lot and they can get grumpy with you. Uh, or grumpy with the world, they can be forgetful, or, they're just, or in fact in prison they, they're very busy. They've got programs, they've got visitors, they've got gym, they've got uh, work, they've got all sorts of things and the medical centre really runs from say 8 o'clock to 5 o'clock. So when you look at the, uh, the attendance rates, uh, they're really quite poor. It's about 60% of booked appointments in outpatients and also specialist outpatients here at St Vincent's. 60% of those are actually not attended. Uh, about 25% are actually refused, clear, flat out refused. Um, okay. All right, so what I'll do now is just talk about three case studies because I think that, they, that lends itself to some of the chronic disease, chronic disease uh, discussion and also uh, uh, towards the palliative care that I'll mention at, at the end. So this first patient was a 40-year-old man who was on methadone. Uh, he had a history of chronic hep C infection which had resulted in cirrhosis and portal hypertension and ultimately ascites and uh, peripheral edema. He'd been treated with diuretics and lactulose and had been stable for a while but all of a sudden um, over a period of days he dropped his potassium magnesium levels to the point where he actually collapsed. Uh, we didn't, didn't know what it was until he did it again and we managed to pick up that he actually had an unconscious ventricular tachycardia with to size the point. <clears throat> Most of the episodes reverted spontaneously but on one occasion he needed to be shocked back into rhythm. He went into ICU for a few days on continuous uh, infusion of potassium eventually came to St Augustine's where he was non-compliant with his fluid restriction. He was restricted to one and a half litres of fluid a day and he uh, refused to comply with that, drinking three or four litres a day, just helping himself to what was in the fridge or the tap. Um, 
eventually settled down, came back to St John's. Uh, they changed him from methadone to suboxone because they thought he was having a bit of peripheral edema from methadone, which probably wasn't the case in the end. Um, however, he continued to be non-compliant and ended up putting on one kilo of fluid a day consecutively till he had gained about 15 or 16 kilos, became breathless, developed ascites, had to go back into hospital. And this sort of to and fro happened for about two or three months. He eventually uh, progressed with his liver failure and in the end uh, uh, he deteriorated to the extent that he required palliation here in the palliative care unit uh, requiring a syringe driver which I'll talk about briefly in a minute. So that was the, that was the first uh, case. The, the second case is a 45 year old itinerant man who had a past history of intravenous uh, drug use with amphetamines and heroin. He also had a history of hep C with cirrhosis and also untreated HIV. When he, when he was first recepted into Port Phillip Prison, he had evidence of self-harm, having cut both his wrists, and he was generally non-compliant with everybody, correctional staff, health staff, everyone. With a lot of persuasion and time and effort, he eventually agreed to have some bloods, particularly because of that untreated HIV. He um, showed uh, low CD4 counts and a, a HIV viral load with some neutropenia and lymphocytosis. He had a, he, a urgent infectious disease referral was made. He remained non-compliant with that, he refused to go. Uh, continued in that vein for about three months and all of a sudden developed fever, ataxia and a left hand tremor. He was sent brought here to St V's, an MRI of his brain showed he had uh, progressive, progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, which is an AIDS-related disease, uh, and lumbar puncture also showed the presence of JC virus. So uh, by the time he'd actually presented, and he, it was quite, he was quite progressed in his uh, disease process to the point where it was actually felt that he really needed to have palliative care. So, and he, he uh, died about two weeks later, yeah, in St Vincent's. <clears throat> the third study is a 45-year-old uh, homeless indigenous man who, again, had a history of IV amphetamines and heroin, also heavy alcohol use, hep C infection again with cirrhosis and an acquired brain injury. Um, he continued in prison to self-inject with suboxone with sharing of needles and he had refused several attempts to engage him in the OSTP program. Um, after about eight months in custody, he developed an acute delirium with a, an expressive dysphasia. Uh, he had a pansystolic murmur on examination and a echo and toe both confirmed he had a large mitral valve uh, vegetation extending into his atrium. CT brain showed he had bilateral embolic cerebral infarcts and his blood culture showed he had uh, Enterococcus fecalis. <clears throat> he, uh, had, had went, uh, he had some intravenous, drug, uh, intravenous antibiotics for a short time and then went on to have a successful mitral valve replacement. Went into rehab. Uh, while he was in hospital, he got released from prison. He then absconded <laughs> and then represented two months later with a recurrent septicemia, no doubt from repeated intravenous drug use. Um, so that hopefully those three case presentations show you the reality of treating patients who uh, have got compliance issues, have got chronic disease <clears throat> in the prison setting. Um, I'll just talk about uh, Simpson's Correctional Health and palliative care. If we can do palliative care, it's going to be in St John's Hospital. Um, every patient, every long-term patient in St John's gets an advanced care directive. Everyone's put on an acute resuscitation plan. Uh, we can provide basic palliation uh, with 24-hour nursing. It usually would mean a single room if, if, the, if there's one available. And uh, it also means if we need to have increased access to the patient. To do that, we need increased resources like a personal care assistant, uh, an extra nurse perhaps, and certainly G4S to be on board in terms of increased security presence, which is required. Um, we also do engage family, so we might have a, a discussion or invite a, a family member who's an enduring power of attorney to have a chat to us about uh, the appropriate next steps. And uh, we can even, with the G4S's uh, permission and uh, 
arrangement, they can have a special visit with, uh, with the patient. Challenges of providing palliative care in uh, any prison, particularly um, our uh, Port Phillip Prison, is that we actually don't have any palliative care trained nursing staff. Um, and uh, because of risk security risks related to having IV tubing, we actually don't have any IV tubes or syringe drivers as a routine. We did get permission to have one patient with a pick line for a few weeks last year, but that was uh, quite extraordinary. All right. Um, I'll just quickly mention causes. Are we going all right for, for the time, Mark? Yeah, OK. <clears throat> I'll just quickly mention this. Just out of interest, over the last, say, perhaps the, in 2015-16, we had a roughly about 15 deaths of uh, patients who were accommodated at Port Phillip Prison. <laughs> Nearly half of those were cardiac-related deaths. <clears throat> um, uh, one was undetermined. The, uh, if you look at the comorbidities of particularly the cardiac-related deaths, out of the seven patients, uh, five of those actually had cancer, a history of cancer. So um, I thought that was quite significant. So out of seven cardiac deaths, five of those had actually had a history of cancer and about four of them actually had colorectal cancer. All right, and that's it. I think I might have <coughs> just made it in time, Mark. <laughs> um, uh, are there any questions? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Are there quick Thank you very much for that. When you talk about the demographics, you can talk about older, really older ones at patients. And I was just wondering about the issue of dementia in sure. the population and what yeah. you would do about it. Yeah. <clears throat> so we certainly have had demented patients. We've actually had end-stage demented patients as well. Where the, just as I said, they've re required personal care assistance, access to the patients almost 24 hours a day because of their wandering and they're falling over. And um, So we can accommodate that. It does take an extra resource. Um, we have all the levels of dementia. The mild, ones with the mild dementia may cope quite well out in the accommodation units. The ones who are maybe a little bit more uh, uh, disabled and unable to care for themselves might have a carer uh, attached to them by G4S, so they'll select a carer who gets paid a little bit more to provide that personal care out in the unit. But when they get to the point where they can't actually manage in the unit, and we get to know those ones because they, they have the falls or we, they, we get reports that they're not taking their medication, that sort of thing. So we can actually admit them to St John's. Yeah, so so um, we, do, we do, do address the demented patients in, uh, I suppose, in an informal way. We do have some policies or guidelines about how to look after uh, patients who might have a cognitive impairment, particularly if they've been assaulted. And we, we make sure that anyone who's been assaulted, we review those uh, at, addressing the possibility that have has this patient who's been assaulted, do they actually have an underlying cognitive impairment or a mental health condition that we need to uh, take more formal steps of following up rather than leaving them to come back and see you because they may forget. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Yeah. Um, in terms of multiculturalism, yeah. uh, is there capacity to be inclusive of traditional uh, medicine or traditional care um, uh, strategies within uh, uh, the medicine and the other care that you uh, Do you mean things like Chinese medicine? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, well, we don't at the moment. We, uh, we have a formulary which is uh, dictated to us by St Vincent's, so, and we stick to the St Vincent's formulary. Um, we haven't had really much of a calling, to be honest, uh, for any traditional medicines. Yes. Yeah. What about, what about um, Indigenous Australians and um, spiritual care and other things like that? Uh, we certainly have pastoral care. Yeah, we also have an Aboriginal health nurse uh, who, uh, whose uh, primary objective is to ma manage and take care of the uh, uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island uh, population. and ensure their needs are met from a healthcare perspective. Do you think any of the non-compliance for treatment, refusal of treatment, mm -hmm. is, any, is in any way linked to a cultural um, uh, misunderstanding and, and which might be informing expectations of care that you're not able to provide? 
It's possible. I think when we have somebody who doesn't speak English, for instance, uh, we'll, we'll get an interpreter involved. So we have had instances where patients have uh, missed appointments and, run, and they, it's not that they refused the appointments, they actually didn't understand what they were, they were required to attend. Or we've had patients who have missed medications because, they, again, they didn't understand the reason for the medication. Even though you might, so sometimes a co-prisoner or, or an inmate will actually be a translator for, for his cellie so that uh, and at other times you need to get on the, onto the phone interpreter service to assist you. So there can certainly be uh, problems in translation. In terms of cultural, uh, it's not something that's been a significant factor, I don't think. But, uh, but certainly interpretation and understanding of, of uh, what we're trying to deal, uh, trying to um, manage uh, by a patient who doesn't speak English can certainly be a, a, a significant factor. Yeah. I just want to know if there's challenges with getting securing an early release for patients that are in a terminal phase of their illness, yeah. the family to visit and things like that. So, okay, so I guess the question was uh, patients who are in the terminal phase and coming up for release, and uh, do you mean things like mercy, please? That is that, yeah. So Justice Health, are the, um, uh, they're the primary decision makers when it comes to putting in a mercy plea. They would certainly ask us for a report, which may uh, be uh, a contributed towards uh, the mercy plea, which will go to, um, <clears throat> well, actually it's hard to know where it goes to exactly. It might be the commissioner, it might be, um, might be even the minister, but, but uh, the uh, the management of terminally ill patients generally, once they get to that stage, they will often be in hospital and then you've got the oncologists and the other specialist units looking after them. If there is a requirement for a, a, a letter, for instance, that needs to be provided uh, by that patient's guardian or, or by the legal team, uh, that's usually done in conjunction with uh, often myself and also as treatment specialist. But the outcome is totally variable, totally variable. We really have no idea. And often patients who are, who are terminally ill might put in a request for, for early release as part of a mercy plea and they're refused. Yeah. 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 I'm just uh, um, I'm really shocked by the statistics that uh, more than 50% uh, of the prisoners are Suffering from mental health, yep. is that right? Yep. So, do you have any sort of screening uh, prior to putting them into prison to see whether uh, those people with mental health can be helped or uh, their crimes they've committed are due to their mental health? Or um, how are we putting? Sure. Uh, uh, because if somebody is, is ill, mentally ill, they play a crime, I mean, certainly, yeah. I wouldn't put them as in the same category as a person with no mental health. Yeah, I think that probably the courts have a different view and we I probably can't answer that question for you because I see them when once they've come in through the door, I don't see them before uh, they, they, um, they, they present for either being remanded or sentenced. So I can't really answer that for you, but certainly, um, uh, when we look at mental health conditions, that's the whole array of Access 1 and Access 2. So it's, you know, we certainly do see patients who are acutely psychotic uh, from time to time, but the reality is m the majority of those patients do have some understanding of, of their actions and, and why they're in prison. Got time for one last question, just to the back there. Um, I guess I'm surprised that there's very, I wonder if that's I'm surprised that there's a very small yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that that graph I showed you uh, were the patients who uh, had active cancer at the time. Yeah. And I guess um, so. The prisoners were cancer would be treated in you know, oncology centres and have specialist treatment when they go to those, when they go outside the prison, could it be assumed that they would be getting, you know, the specialist 
Uh, so when they're released, you mean? Back in prison. Oh, back in prison. Yeah, absolutely. They've got access to... Yeah, so the question is, do the pa cancer patients have access to oncology and cancer services? Absolutely. In fact, uh, I think they get excellent care and, ac and, and very good access to oncology services, day treatment centres, um, and uh, radiotherapy, which includes also not just the St Vincent's, but also going out to Peter McCallum Cancer Institute. So. We, uh, we make sure that they're a priority when it comes to getting treatment and making sure that they get on the bus to get to their, wherever they need to go. Absolutely, yeah. All right. Okay, okay. so thank you very much. Um, thank you for listening to me. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so um, on behalf of the Centre for Palliative Care in the audience today, Charles, I'm presenting you with um, I'm assuming it's a bottle of something or other that may stay with you and may not get through security when you go back to Port Phillip. But it's, it's very instructive um, hearing from Charles because the interface between what's happening at Port Phillip and what's happening at St Vincent's um, often seems quite distant and it is physically, but often there's a lot of similar issues that we're working through when these patients come to us. So it's very informative <laughs> to hear that even though the population have... Uh, is, is minimal in terms of, of the sense of cancer population, but it does predominate the work and the patients that flow into us, so we can corroborate what um, Charles is saying. And also, though, we are very mindful of the mental health issues in caring for people in a palliative care environment, but also the, then the subsequent consequence of the social and mental health issues that sit with the family and the carers who are actually part of this as well, which often gets missed sometimes, obviously for prisoners that are in the in the prisons but are with us here at St Vincent. So thank you again Charles and uh, look forward to our ongoing uh, connection. So thank you. Thank you.